Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Chris Lawrence and I'm Community Manager at Zentro. For those of you not familiar with Zentro, Zentro is a global online marketplace that helps connect companies with highly specialized consultants and other expertise providers for projects that range from one-hour phone consults to multi-month on-site engagements. I would like to thank the over 100 people who signed up for today's webinar, Strategy and Preparation of an Investigational Device Exemption Application by Suzanne Smith. It's with great pleasure I introduce Zintro expert Suzanne Smith, Medical Device Clinical and Regulatory Affairs Medical Writer with STS Biomedical Consulting. Suzanne has over 30 years of medical device industry experience from small startups to publicly traded companies. She worked at Colligan Corp and collaborated on a successful investigational device exemption pivotal trial with subsequent pre-market approval application for a dental implant alveoform biograft. She was a director of clinical and regulatory affairs for Target Therapeutics and received IDE approval for the Guglielmi detachable coil for endovascular embolization to treat inoperable aneurysms. She also directed clinical research for endovascular coils to treat cranial malformations and gained pre-market notifications for peripheral catheters. We will include a couple of poll questions throughout the webinar. If you would like to ask Suzanne any specific questions, feel free to use the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel in the top right corner of your screen at any time throughout the webinar. Suzanne will respond questions after this presentation. We will provide Suzanne's contact information at the end of this webinar for follow-ups, so stay tuned. Without further ado, I would like to turn it over now to our presenter, Suzanne Smith. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. My objectives for this webinar is an overview of the regulatory submission statistics as far as the number of submissions FDA receives on an annual basis. Also, to focus on some specific IDE regulations and strategic points in the preparation and filing of the IDE application because these applications are very large. Some of them can be thousands of pages. And also to focus on some specific regulations that apply to a feasibility and a pivotal trial to maintain compliance. You'll be hearing compliance from me a lot. Regulatory submissions. Um, I compiled this table for you so you can see the number of submissions FDA receives on an annual basis. Just focus actually for you on the original IDEs and the IDE supplement. I can only find the 1999 to 2009 FDA's focused are now on PMA, the number of PMA approvals. But I just want you to be aware of the number of submissions FDA receives and wear your regulatory hat and how to strategically prepare your IDE submission so that the reviewer can navigate the document very quickly. In addition to that, there's multiple reviewers and I'll discuss that a little later. In the table also, just to make you aware, because I'm not sure how large the companies are or how small the companies are that you work for, the large medical device companies pay thousands of dollars for reviews. IDEs at this point in time, uh, as far as I know, are, do not have any fees. But if you're a small medical device company, it would behoove you to look at the regulations to see if you can be determined to be a small be designated as a small business so that you don't have to pay for a PMA or the, the fees will be wavered for you. As you can see, there's thousands and thousands of documents that FDA receives. So I just want to let you know what you're competing against and who you're competing against their time for. Within the IDE regulations, I'd like to point out there's two clauses in the beginning of the IDE regulations as far as what clinical investigations are exempted from the IDE regs. One is a device that's a transitional device. Transitional devices are those commercial devices that were on the market before the medical device regulations went into effect in May 1976. One of those devices, I was involved in a transitional device where we were a company, it was a suture company, and their suture was classified as a class three. Some of these transitional devices are class threes. FDA may at some point contact the sponsor of the manufacturer and ask for them to file a PMA, or the sponsor or the manufacturer may want to down classify it to a class two. It's a very large project. It's, it does take a lot of time and it can be very expensive. But I just want to let you know that as long as your device has substantial equivalence, you have a pre-market approval or a 510K on it, you can conduct a clinical trial providing it's within its indications for use labeling. 
Another one that you should be aware of is that there also is a consumer preference testing. This is a little gray, and I'd be a little careful of how you interpret your device, whether it's significant or a non-significant risk. If you have a commercial device and you want to do a clinical trial, you can do the clinical trial on your device or even two devices with two different indications, as long as you're not collecting clinical data to determine the safety and effectiveness of the device, and also it does not put patients at risk. It would behoove you to actually review the guidance documents for risk determination, whether significant or a non-significant risk determination, and also labeling. FDA has lots and lots of guidance documents. You could spend hours on their website looking for things. But if you're going to be communicating with FDA about any risk to a patient, you need to have your ducks in a row. You need to know what you want to communicate to them, and you need to understand where they're coming from. A couple of years ago, I had a client. They had two medical devices, both 510Ks, two separate indications, but the company wanted to do a clinical study on both of these devices in the same patient. The initial discussions before I got involved with FDA is that the medical officer was concerned that it would put a patient at risk and they would have to do the clinical study under an IDE. Um, I worked with FDA. It took about six to nine months, but working with FDA, I was able to convince FDA um, that the device was actually a non-significant risk, and I was able to receive a non-significant non risk determination from FDA for the client. Essentially, they saved millions of dollars of not having to do a clinical study under an IDE. The other thing I'd like to point out is industry, um, I think sometimes naively, if they have a clinical trial, it's very common to put in the title that you're going to evaluate your device for the safety and effectiveness or efficacy. I would suggest that you not use those terms in your clinical protocols on a commercial basis, but only use more generic names like clinical outcomes and complications. Chris, we have a few questions we'd like to pose to you. So Chris, would you mind asking the first question? We'd like to understand the demographics of our audience. We'll go ahead and have our poll question. Uh, it reads as follows. What size is the company you work for? First option is small to mid-sized company under 100 employees. And the second is large company over 100 employees. We will allow uh, a couple of minutes for our attendees to respond. Okay, we just closed the poll, and the results, as you can see on your screen, come in as 85% for a small, mid-sized company, and 15% uh, work for a large company. Back to you, Suzanne. Great, thank you. So as far as preparing the IDE, um, for those of you who are just entering in the process, or your company is thinking about filing an IDE, I would suggest that you go back to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. We call that the Act. It's a very small white book. It addresses medical devices, pharmaceuticals, and biologics. And it's where the regulations, the ID regulations, all the parts and subparts of the regulations emanate from. So the IDE regulation is within the 21 Code CFR Part A12. And what does the IDE allow a sponsor to do? One, to collect safety and efficacy data to support a new clinical evaluation or device modifications. Sometimes the engineers like to modify their devices, and it, then it comes down to, is that modification, could that put patient at a significant risk? New intended uses of a 510K device or new indications. It also allows the sponsor to ship their investigational device within interstate commerce between states, Washington, D.C., and territories such as Puerto Rico. Also, the IDE permits the shipment for a clinical investigation without complying with other requirements that a commercial device would have to follow under the Act, such as establishment re registration. A medical device company has to file register with FDA, also a medical device listing. The pre-market notification special controls. If you have a 510K, if you have special controls such as sterilization, ASCM, quality system regulations. Labeling requirements. You're, the exemption allows you to have labeling, but you will not be evaluated or reviewed by FDA for misbranding or, or adulterated product. In addition to that, you do not report adverse events or unanticipated adverse device events 
in the medical device MDR regulations. All data and all information that is shared with FDA is kept confidential. So even your safety is confidential. It's not in the public domain. I'm not going to discuss this entire table. I just created for you so you can see the pre-submission meeting with FDA. There's different types of meetings you can have with FDA uh, regarding an IDE. But I wanted you to be aware of how long it will take. It can take months. You may not be able to meet FDA for six months. So I wanted to prepare you for the timing of all this because it will take a long time. The other thing I would strongly suggest to you that I've learned over the years, and it's in red at the bottom, and it's my suggestion to you, draft your instructions for use and your indications first. Get it down in writing and get your team together. Get the clinical and regulatory people, R&D, marketing, all the people who will influence the product description, its labeling, and its promotion. It will keep you all on, this, on a straight path. You will all be talking the same language, and you will all have the same expectations at the end of the day. The other thing about FDA and their meetings is, is, and even their teleconferences, if you have a meeting with FDA, typically it's an hour, and they will hold you to that hour. So if you actually go and meet with FDA face-to-face, -face, you have to be prepared. It needs to be staged. Nobody can come to the meeting unprepared. I have worked with clients where we've worked on the presentation for a week. I've worked with clients where it's taken two days. Usually, the biggest challenge is trying to get the physician on board and have him, him or her focus on what they need to say. There is no spontaneity in any of these meetings with FTA. So just have your ducks in a row and make sure everybody understands what they're supposed to say, what will not be discussed, and what the expectations are of the meeting. Typically, the people that go to the meeting at FDA just keep it as small as possible, and it's usually the president, the VP of clinical regulatory, um, or a director, maybe one of the engineers or the people who know the device and can explain it. Um, I suggest that if you can, bring the device with you for a show and tell with FDA. Sometimes that's impossible, but bring good images of it so that they can get engaged and they can understand what you're trying to achieve. The contents of an IDE. First of all, I would use this as your template. Um, all of the subparts and the sections with the regulations, you use this as your guiding template. In addition to that, I would use this template and make a timeline against all of the different sections because there's not one person who will be writing an IDE. It's usually multiple people. You will have, I also would suggest that any final documents and sections that are written by different divisions or departments that the management, the VP, the director, who's ever responsible for that, reviews the final document and signs off on it. This information that you're filing is going to the federal government. If anything's fraudulent, it's a federal offense. It needs to be taken seriously. Some of the people ask, where do certain things go? Well, if you read the guidance documents, FDA will give you guidance on what sections go where, such as in 812.27, report of prior investigations. These can be your publications, uh, other product publications, your preclinical results, your engineering results, um, and wherever you can, use lots of images, pictures, tables to just compress the data. When you file your IDE, it will be filed to the Office of Device Evaluation, but it goes through document control first. That takes 48 to 72 hours before you, FDA loads it up um, on their computer, and the written document actually gets to the ODE, the Office of Device Evaluation. You will have to file three copies, hard copies, and just so that you're aware of it, Everything needs to be exactly the same. Your e-copy that will be on the CD-ROM needs to be exactly the same as the paper document. If you have any pictures that are in color, make sure they're all in color. You don't do one copy and have the others as black and white. Have all the sections tabbed, have it professional looking. You will have labels on it. Some of these IDEs will be 10 inches thick. Each section will be at least two inches thick. FDA does not like anything thicker than two inches. There is guidance documents on the submission of the IDE and how to prepare for it. 
once it gets into ODE, then it will be given to the different sections of FDA, such as orthopedics and restorative devices, or ophthalmology, neuro, or cardiology. Um, I just want to prepare you that when it gets to a primary reviewer, if you look at these sections, the reviewer has multiple experts who will be reviewing the IDE behind the primary reviewer. They could be engineers, microbiologists, physicians, mechanical engineers, immunologists. You don't know and you won't see any of those people, but they will be reviewing the different sections. Then the questions or deficiency questions or asking for more information will be sent back to the primary reviewer. The letter will be compiled and you will receive it within 30 days. To my experience over the last five years, FDA has been very good about replying within 30 days. However, the reason why it would behoove you to have a very professional, easy to navigate document is because if FDA gets rushed to the 30-day deadline, you may get more questions than actual information that can guide you into the response. Typically, the deficiency response you will have 45 days to review, or excuse me, respond to. Okay, the purpose of the clinical trial within the IDE. I just listed the investigational plan for you, and within each of these sections, you will be providing information. It would help if you do a study synopsis first with your team so that you know the name of the, de the device, its intended use, the clinical objectives of the clinical study and the study duration. Is it going to be a short feasibility study of, of six months, three sites, or is it going to be your pivotal study of three to 500 patients across 25 sites and internationally? The other thing I'd like to point out in the protocol is that it needs to be scientifically and statistically valid. Go to the PMA regs and read in part 814 what is scientifically and statistically valid. Scientifically, it would behoove you to use validated clinical instruments or questionnaires and statistically valid. You'll have multiple endpoints, but when you actually need to meet your validity, your p-value, it's usually a composite score of different clinical outcomes. So you need to be aware of you're looking at safety and efficacy. There are two important areas of the protocol to be focused on. The risk analysis is not only about the patient, it's also about the end users. A monitoring procedure you will need to file the standard operating procedures of how you're going to monitor the site. You can file a draft SOP, that's okay, I've done it in the past, but I just want to let you be aware that you're going to have to file that. Labeling, not only is it, you will have to file instructions for use, but you also will need to file to the IRB and FDA the patient subject recruitment materials, the pamphlets, the videos, things like that. The sponsor's IDE compliance, this is really important. The sponsor has responsibilities within the regulations to select clinical investigators and clinical monitors. One, the investigators need to device control. So you can, the sponsor can shift the device to qualified investigators, meaning they've been trained on, on the device, and the clinical study investigational plan. That needs to be documented. Also, they will be signing agreements, which we call research agreements. They can be anywhere from 12 to 20 pages long. It's a contractual agreement. Typically, a large institution may sign it. I would suggest both the institution and the clinical investigator sign the research agreement so he or she knows their obligations. Within that agreement, there will be the CV, the investigator, and it has to be reported to FDA, the investigator's experience. You can't have a neurosurgeon putting in a heart valve. If an investigator has been terminated from a previous study, the IRB will let you know if your investigator has ever been disqualified. I gave you terms, disqualified, totally restricted, get on FDA's website. Some of you, I think, will be surprised to see some of those names on there. The investigator, when they sign the agreement, they will be committing to following the investigational plan and all of the federal regulations that they are responsible to. Also, supervising the device. If the investigator is trained, and the co-investigators are trained, those are the only people that can implant or use the device on the patient after they have signed an informed consent. I cannot tell you how many times patients have signed consent after the treatment. That is a deviation and that needs to be reported to FDA. 
Also, there will be reporting of financial disclosure. If there's any stocks, is there any financial interest in the company? Qualified monitors. You need to hire. If you don't have a clinical staff to do your clinical monitoring, you'll have to work with the CRO or independent CRAs. They are out there to make sure that the clinical site, the investigators, the, the site is following all of the regulations that they need to follow, and that the site is in compliance. The GMPs. GCPs, excuse me, FDA feels that the IDE regulations are written adequately enough so that it covers the GCPs, but you'll see references to it. The clinical investigator's responsibility is to conduct the clinical trial per the agreement and the investigational plan. He also needs to apply, oh, I'm sorry, there's a typo, but he needs to protect the patient's rights to make sure that they're treated ethically and safely. He also has to, he or she has to supervise the device. Usually the devices are locked up in a secure area so that nobody else can use those devices or put it in somebody who is not participating in the study. The device accountability, the numbers that shipped, the lot numbers, the date it was implanted, into which patient for traceability, and that that is something that needs to be updated all the time and in compliance. The investigator records, you'll have regulatory binders, and you'll have all the documents. A lot of it's now electronic, or it may be in paper. Also, the sponsor will have to disqualify investigators. This is very hard to do. I've had to do it in the past. It's not pleasant, but the investigator who repeatedly or deliberately fails to follow the investigational plan or deviates from the protocol or submits false information will need to have to be disqualified. Protocol. Deviations are patients who do not have their procedures done. Physicians, investigators cannot ignore the investigational plan or the procedures that are in it. He or she cannot not get lab values or lab tests. They cannot ignore radi the radiographs that they have to get. They have to follow the investigational plan. The investigator reports to the sponsor any unanticipated adverse device effects. This is any effect that is not written in the protocol and in informed consent. If something happens to the patient and it's not in the protocol and informed consent, it will be determined as an unanticipated adverse device effect. If that occurs, it needs to be submitted within 10 working days. The IRB approval withdrawal. I have had that happen too, where FDA, uh, excuse me, the IRB will withdraw an investigator. Annual progress reports, investigational plan deviations. The monitor will be going out to ensure that the, the investigators and the co-investigators and the study staff are following the plan. And if they're not, it needs to be documented. No informed consent, it happens. And also a final report. The investigator needs to file a final report after termination, termination is not a good regulatory term or study completion. The termination means that the study was terminated earlier than expected. The sponsor also has regulatory requirements within the IDE. They also have to submit to FDA if no informed consents are being collected. The UADE, withdrawal of IRB approval. Current investigator list. The IDE you have to think of as a living document. You will have to file every six months the name of all of the clinical investigators and co-investigators, the IRBs, and the chairman's name. In addition, there's an annual progress report that's filed to the FDA about the IDE. And there's FDA has guidance documents on what they want to review. If a device is recalled or the device is returned to the sponsor, or repair, it malfunction, or whatever, that needs to be reported also, in addition to a final report at the end of the study. So what are the clinical and regulatory objectives of doing a clinical trial? And what does it do for the sponsor? I've listed some things. There are others. But I listed some things that, through the years, I've learned. One is to help expand the clinical indications for commercialization to support the labeling. Two. Regulatory people use any clinical evidence to do global registrations. You can do international trials. Um, when you do an international trials, you like to have the patient population similar to your 
your U.S. population so that FDA can see that there's going to be generalization of the clinical use of the product. It also supports reimbursement efforts for the technical review assessments for CT for a CPT code. Technical review assessments is where somebody, usually marketing or somebody, will go and meet with experts and present the product, its benefits, its cost, its effectiveness. And that's to get the CPT code if there is none. Sometimes new products and new indications are not going to be covered by a third party insurer. So you have to get a new CPT code, which is a current procedure terminology code. It also helps support quality and the R&D to validate their design changes and final product release. It also helps provide evidence to minimize product liability exposure. The first job I had in the 80s, there was a product liability lawsuit. I ended up being deposed, the clinical staff ended up being deposed, and it almost bankrupted the company. It took years to resolve. In addition, it also supports the consumers in their publications, abstracts, and podium presentations. I have always told and promised an investigator, if you participate in this IDE, your data will be rock solid. You will be able to stand at a podium or do a publication, and that data will be true, and there will be no manipulation of the statistics. When you file your, when you file your PMA or your reports, there is a possibility that the statisticians will review the data, definitely with the PMA. FDA has their own statisticians. The statisticians will review the protocol and the statistical methods of what tests you will be using to, to measure your primary endpoints. If you get on FDA's website, just refer to these other regulations, um, protection for human subjects, and you can see the list. Institutional Review Board, if you're not familiar with that. There are, the large institutions have institutional review boards. Um, years ago, industry could speak with them. Now institutions have their own research departments. So typically, you will be working through the research department. You will not be talking to the IRB. If anything, the IRB does not want to talk to industry anymore. But it was much faster and easier, so you need to give yourself time if you're going to be working through these different research contract groups within the institution. It will take months to get through. They will be working through also with the research agreement. A lot of the times you will not be able to start your clinical trial until the research agreement is signed, the IDE is approved with conditional approvals or full approval, and the budget has, has been initiated. Also with financial disclosure within clinical investigators, that has to absolutely be absolutely true with no missing information at all. GLPs for non-clinical laboratories, there are times when small medical device companies did not conduct their, their laboratory tests under GLPs. If that's the case, you're going to have to explain why you didn't do it under GLP. Also, as I mentioned, read over the pre-market approval to see what's the next step after the IDE and the quality system regulation. I can tell you from experience, FDA will allow you to make modifications to your device within the IDE as long as they are not significant. However, I would also have a conversation with FDA on what those modifications will be. I had one client that I had to file an IDE supplement for a manufacturing change, it was 1,232 pages long. It took them a year and a half to get FDA to give them a conditional and eventually a full approval. So it behooves you to be in contact with the reviewer all the time on what's going on with your IDE. If you type in clinical trials and IDE guidance documents, you'll find over 30 references on FDA's website about the IDE. Years ago, there weren't as much guidance documents, and people would complain, industry would complain to FDA that the IDE regs are too gray. We don't know what you mean. I always had worked for small medical device startup companies, but I've also worked for a few of the larger ones. It actually benefits small medical device companies to have gray regulations so you can interpret them to the size of your company. 
it's one thing to have an SOP that may be 10 to 25 pages long. But if you go to the big medical device companies, those SOPs will be in a three-inch binder. One thing about SOPs is that you have to comply with them. FDA will come in and inspect your site. When you file for a PMA, FDA typically will go and audit the top three recruiters. Those top three investigators who put the most patients into the study will have their site audited. The sponsor cannot participate in that audit. They can be in attendance, but they're a silent partner. The questions will be directed to the clinical investigator, the principal clinical investigator. So before you file your documents to FDA, I would suggest that you do one final audit of each site and make sure that your record keeping is pristine. Also, FDA will go to the manufacturer and, and conduct their audits there too. The IDEs that I filed and the P, for the PMAs, FDA did not review our clinical records at all. However, they can. In addition to that, I have had the experience where FDA has gone in to audit an IRB, close an IRB, because they weren't complying with the regulations and the IRB membership that they were supposed to be doing which almost jeopardized all the studies that were being conducted in that one institution. So FDA can go in to IRBs, see what clinical studies are being done, and then go and follow the trail to audit your study. Some of my conclusions for you. Prepare and schedule the pre-submission with FDA, either on-site or at the teleconference, as early as possible. I would suggest, I know it's hard for small medical device companies, but I would suggest on-site meetings with FDA. Get to know who the people are at FDA, who's your, your principal or primary reviewer, the department chief, the section chief, and all the other potential reviewers. It's one way to present who you are, who your team is, and that you really know your product in and out. It's not selling it but it enhances your relationship with FDA because at least you know who you're going to be talking to. If initially that doesn't work for you, teleconferences are just as good, but again, just because it's a teleconference doesn't mean you can be disorganized. You have to have a plan and you practice it. Practice ahead and think ahead of what potential questions FDA may ask you so you're prepared. Review the guidance document for an IDE copy preparation. You can have a beautiful document, a hard copy, and if your CD-ROM is not complying with the IDE copy preparation, they'll reject it. And you'll get a letter within 24 hours that is not accepted. Don't forget to complete the 3514 PDH pre-market review submission form. It's about five pages long, and it can take a little while to fill it out. Check the bottom of the page, make sure it's the most recent date. FDA keeps changing it. Determine if you need a user fee. It needs to be paid. FDA reviewers and experts will critique, and they're very good in responding in 30 days. After the submission is filed, start checking your emails, because you may be getting emails from FDA or phone messages. Years ago, FDA, the only way that you would hear from FDA is in writing. Now it's more interactive. I've had FDA contact me before the 30 days was up to get some more clarification or get another document just to get one of the deficiency questions off the table. Again, usually FDA will give you 45 days unless it's denied and then they won't put a timeline on it. But if you don't think you're going to meet those 45 days, then ask for an extension. Ask for a 30-day extension, 60-day extension. I've asked for six-month extension, which I've received. As long as you have a good reason why, they will grant it to you. The documents need to be clearly written with proper and simple English and good grammar. Don't baffle them with engineering and scientific minutiae. It's not going to help you. If anything, it may generate more questions. Draft the IDE sections and timelines with accountable writers and department heads for drafted sections and request sign-offs for the final documents. I would recommend the same internal reviewers of your staff and writers for the overall document and its sections for consistency and readability. 
Everybody has different writing styles, but the clearer and the simpler you can make it to get a very, hmm, very hard concept across will help you in the long run. Use diagrams and tables and images to explain complex data and concepts and perform. This is probably the most important thing to do at the end of the document writing. Perform the quality review for the documents to make sure it's complete. All the references are there. Make sure nothing's missing. You don't have wrong sections. The numbering of the pages are correct. You use a bait stamp because, as I told you, they take the hard copy, or they'll do it now on the computer. They separate sections out, and then they'll put it back. So that would really help the reviewer. But I would suggest that you put it down for a weekend and then pick it up and read it from cover to cover one more time before it goes in. Thank you very much. I think I finished early, so if anybody has any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. If I can't answer them, I will take the question and um, get back to you if you email me or call me. Thank you. Okay, Centro members, uh, feel free to contact Suzanne directly with the information provided or by going directly to her Centro profile. Uh, we will keep uh, the webinar session open for another 15 minutes so Suzanne can respond questions by our attendees. So, uh, right away, we're going to have our first question from Galvin. Uh, he asks, does collagen from a jellyfish source rather than a bovine require an IDE for 510K for use in bone graft substitutes? Yes, yes. Um, the question, uh, I'm not sure it, what, what the safety risk is for the patient, but you would probably have to, I would have a conversation with FDA and figure out if they would determine if it's a significant risk or not. But you will have to, you will have to file if it goes into a patient. Okay, thanks, Suzanne. Uh, now we have another question from Donald, and he asks, what is required to manufacture a product in the U.S. and conduct studies outside the U.S.? As far as, as far as the manufacturer conducting a clinical trial um, outside the U.S., if you're going into Europe, you're going to have to file to the European authorities under the medical device directives. Um, the, you, the other country governments don't recognize FDA's regulation, so you're going to have to comply with the, each country's regulation. But Europe, because of the medical device directives, um, that will explain to you in, se in Section 10, Annex 10, uh, what has to go into a trial. Okay, we're going to have our last question from Jeffrey asking, can you comment on a unique requirement for IBDs and share any experience you may have with these? Um, yes, actually I worked on IBDs uh, on breast cancer and ovarian cancer IBDs. It, it was a while back in the 90s. Actually FDA has very good guidance documents on IBDs um, as far as what the type of I, uh, IVD is, is it a monitoring, is it prognostic, is it a screening uh, IVD? Um, and the IVDs are considered devices, so they do go through Office of Device Evaluation, but I would suggest that you get on FDA's website, type in in vitro, di in vitro diagnostic guidance documents, and you'll find them there. I hope that answers your question. All right, uh, Suzanne, uh, on behalf of Centro and our 140,000 members, thank you so much for sharing your insights. And this closes today's presentation. I wish all of you a very nice day. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.